professor uh, Ari Fischler. Uh, he, he will uh, do this very valuable and interesting topic for modern hypertension. Thank you again. Yeah, I can talk to you about sheep some more. Oh, we're not tired of my sheep yet. This time I'm going to talk about pulmonary hypertension and a project that we've been working on for quite a while. Uh, one of my last major focuses the last 10 years or so has been the physiology of nitric oxide and the metabolism of nitric oxide in vivo. Uh, so this plays into that a little bit. I have no disclosures for this one either. Uh, so I'm going to go over a little bit of nitric oxide metabolism, which hopefully is new to some of you. Uh, we'll talk about how we study pulmonary hypertension in the newborn land model, and then how inhaled nitrite uh, may be a potential treatment for pulmonary hypertension. So inhaled nitric oxide gas is kind of the go-to therapy in the United States for pulmonary hypertension in the newborn. I understand it's not available here, um, unfortunately. But the, the idea behind inhaled nitric oxide gas was that uh, it would be selective to the lung. You would get good pulmonary nasodilation because that's the vascular bed that's first hit by the inhaled nitric oxide. And the half-life of nitric oxide is actually very short so that it would be restricted, its effects would be restricted to the lung. Uh, usually you think of nitric oxide and you know it's a free radical, you think it's very reactive. Um, it's surprisingly unreactive in the oxygenated saline and just the presence of oxygen has a half-life of about five minutes. Plasma, that drops down to about 20 seconds. And whole blood, it's down to about two milliseconds. So blood and hemoglobin very rapidly scavenges nitric oxide. And uh, so because of that, when you consider that it takes blood about five to 15 seconds to get from the lung to the rest of the body, and the half-life of nitric oxide is only two milliseconds, you would probably expect that any inhaled nitric oxide is only going to affect the lung. It won't be able to survive the circulation to the systemic vasculature to have effects. But that's not what we uh, learned about the studies with nitric oxide in animals and in humans. We find that it has lots of systemic effects. Uh, when you inhale therapeutic uh, concentrations of nitric oxide, you see increases in brain blood flow, uh, protection of various organs against ischemia or reperfusion injury, uh, decreased glucoside adhesion in the gut. So the question is, how is nitric oxide, which has certainly gone before the blood even leaves the lung, having these systemic effects? And uh, so the first thing you might want to look at is what are the metabolites of nitric oxide that might be able to circulate systemically and have these effects? Sounds simple, right? So you look at what is what are the metabolites of nitric oxide? come up with papers that have very complicated diagrams like this, which looks to me to be the same as, as this. But I like to simplify things because I'm not that great of a chemist. And if you only look at the compounds on this diagram that have a half-life in blood long enough to survive the transit from the lungs to the rest of the body, that narrows it down very significantly. So there's really only nitrate nitrite and nitrosophiols, the rest of the nitric oxide containing compounds on this diagram are very short, short lived and probably don't survive to the systemic circulation. So let's focus, for this talk I'm gonna talk mostly about nitrite and nitrate. The conventional thinking for nitric oxide metabolism in the body has been that it's, yes, it's produced from l arginine by nitric oxide synthase, in the endothelium as well as in lots of other types of tissue. And then from there, nitric oxide can be oxidized into nitrite or it can be oxidized into nitrate. And both of these historically have been considered to be relatively inert. They just get excreted in the urine. And this has kind of been considered to be a one-way path towards the elimination of nitric oxide metabolites. But what we've learned over the last 10 or 15 years now is that this is actually not unidirectional. And uh, so for nitrite, nitrate, sorry, your salivary glands take nitrate from the plasma and they concentrate it into the saliva by about tenfold. And there are bacteria in your mouth that reduce the nitrite 
sorry, reduce the nitrate into nitrite uh, in the oral mucosa, and then you swallow that saliva, which is high in nitrite concentrations. That leads to an elevation in blood nitrite concentrations, and that has been associated with decreases in blood pressure and increases in exercise performance, protection against ischemia reperfusion. And uh, so if there's one take home from this talk for your own health, if not for your babies, it's that you should eat lots of vegetables and, and foods that are high in nitrate. This has been found to be very protective with men, especially in the cardiovascular um, Once the nitrite is in your system, there are now pathways described whereby nitrite can be reduced back into nitric oxide. So now we can think about that inhaled nitric oxide, which may have been converted to nitrite in the blood. When we take blood samples from babies that are being treated with inhaled nitric oxide, we measure about a two-fold increase in their plasma nitrite concentrations. And in animal studies, that's enough of an increase to protect against ischemia reperfusions that have blood pressure effects, systemic blood pressure effects. And there's now a long list of studies, there's something like 25 or 30 studies that have shown that if you raise blood nitrite concentrations two or three fold, which is what you can do from a couple helpings of spinach or leafy greens or, or beets, that has uh, confers protection against ischemia reperfusion injury in, in a number of different organs in the body. So the first interest in this uh, came from the uh, realization that there's a reaction that exists for nitrite reacting with deoxyhemoglobin that produces nitric oxide. This was actually described in 1935, back before people even really knew that nitric oxide was important in the body. Uh, but it was kind of pulled out of the archives when they were trying to figure out what are the peripheral effects of nitric oxide, inhaled nitric oxide. And the beauty of this reaction would be that if wherever you have nitrite circulating in the plasma, together with deoxyhemoglobin, that's going to be a tissue where you want to deliver more oxygen to restore the oxygen delivery, you'd be making a vasodilator that could cause the vasodilation and kind of help to match oxygen delivery to oxygen need. And so some of the early studies with nitrite showed that if you infuse nitrite into the brachial artery, you get an increase in forearm blood flow. And it's dose dependent. Um, there's a lot of uh, other studies that have kind of uh, fit with this hypothesis that deoxyhemoglobin and nitrite may uh, act together to become a vasodilator. So um, those studies have kind of were just being completed when um, myself and another grad student in the lab that I was working with uh, kind of stumbled upon this. And at the time, we were thinking a lot about pulmonary hypertension. And uh, we had a newborn lamb model of pulmonary hypertension. So most of you know that unlike the brain, which I've been talking about in my other two talks today, uh, the brain responds to hypoxia by vasodilating. The lung is the opposite. It responds to hypoxia by vasoconstrictor. And we can take newborn lambs and we can put in a swan gans catheter into the pulmonary artery and flow probe around the pulmonary artery and turn down the FiO2. And when we do that, we get a nice, reproducible, consistent pulmonary hypertension. So each of these gray bars is what happens to the pulmonary artery pressure when we decrease the FiO2. And we can sustain that level of pulmonary hypertension for 30 or 40 minutes is very reproducible. So it's a nice model of pulmonary hypertension without any significant change in systemic blood pressure. So we have this model. We kind of stumbled upon this nitric oxide research. And we began to wonder, well, what would happen if we inhale nitrite into the, the lung? It's the uh, pulmonary arteries that have the most deoxygenated blood in the circulation circulation, that's going to have plenty of deoxyhemoglobin, especially under hypoxic conditions, and maybe we can stimulate this reaction to produce nitric oxide and cause vasodilation. So we took newborn lambs, 3 to 10 days old, we anesthetized, uh, ventilated, paralyzed, and we put in brachial artery catheters so that we could draw blood gases, 
and a venous line, uh, put in a femoral arterial line to measure blood pressure, and a swan gas cath and a pulmonary artery. We gave the nitrite as an uh, aerosolized uh, solution, so we mixed nitrite and saline, put it into a disposable nebulizer, and just uh, nebulize it into the uh, mechanical ventilation circuit. So we gave the lambs either nitrite or saline, and this is the saline response. So during hypoxia, we get a nice increase in pulmonary artery pressure with very little change and uh, mean systemic pressure. And this is measurement of the exhaled nitric oxide gas that doesn't change if uh, you just inhale in saline. Compared to the other group of animals which receive nitrite. So when we start the nitrite nebulization, we get a nice reproducible decrease in pulmonary artery pressure. Again, with no significant change in systemic blood pressure. And these animals begin to exhale nitric oxide gas. So there's evidence that the nitrite that we are inhaling is being converted into nitric oxide gas. Um, and some of that's escaping in the exhale there. Um, so we next wonder, well, uh, are the effects of inhaled nitrite more prolonged than those of inhaled nitric oxide? One of the drawbacks to inhaled nitric oxide therapy, uh, which, by the way, doesn't always work, I think in about 40% of the babies that are treated with inhaled nitric oxide gas, you get uh, less than adequate response. But even those that do respond, one of the problems that comes up is you get a profound pulmonary uh, rebound hypertension when you turn off the nitric oxide. And so we wanted to look at the inhaled nitrite and see if that uh, is similar or not. Um, so this, these are lambs that were treated with inhaled nitric oxide, 20 parts per million, which is the clinical treatment. It's a good vasodilator, but as soon as we turn it off within uh, two or three minutes after turning off the inhaled nitric oxide, the pulmonary pressures jump back up to an elevated level. So we did another study where we exposed the lambs to 90 minutes of hypoxia with a 20 minute period of nitrite inhalation starting about 10 to 15 minutes into the protocol. And this is the response. So before we inhale the nitrite, we've got pulmonary hypertension, which is um, at least partially resolved with the inhaled nitrite. And even after we stop the inhaled nitrite, the pulmonary artery pressures remain low for the remainder of the 90 minutes. Uh, we see an increase in exhaled nitric oxide again, so evidence that the nitrite is being converted into nitric oxide. Uh, and uh, one of the things you always watch out for with inhaled nitric oxide is methemoglobinemia, uh, but there is no evidence of that in some of these lamps. So the effect of the inhaled nitrite appears to have less of a rebound pulmonary hypertension when you turn it off than what we see with inhaled nitric oxide. So this had been with inhaled nitrite, and for a lot of the babies that you would want to treat with uh, for pulmonary hypertension, they have endovelic catheters. You could just as easily give this intravenously. So we came back later to do another study with the idea that if inhaled nitrite is acting by this reaction with deoxyhemoglobin to make nitric oxide, we should get the same effect if we just give it intravenously. That's the blood that's headed right into the lung. It's got deoxyhemoglobin we fully expected to see the same response. This is where things got a little bit uncertain. It turned out when we did the experiment in these animals, we exposed them to hypoxia, they get pulmonary hypertension, and then when we started the nitrate and infusion intravenously, it had absolutely no effect on the pulmonary artery pressure. And so we had already published a previous study with inhaled nitrate, we panicked a little bit, and we thought, well, we better just redo that study altogether and make sure it works. So we did two more groups of animals that got inhaled nitrite or inhaled nitric oxide, both of which did still have the decrease in pulmonary artery pressure. So for some reason, inhaled nitrite appears to have pulmonary vasodilatory effects, but intravenous nitrite does not. Uh, one possible explanation would be that maybe we were not giving enough uh, nitrite infusion intravenously to match the same levels that would be needed to get pulmonary hypertension, uh, pulmonary vasodilation. But we actually measured the blood concentrations of nitrite in both the inhaled nitrite groups and the intra intravenous nitrite groups. And if anything, the animals that received the IV nitrite had higher blood levels than the ones that were getting it inhaled. 
field, so that doesn't appear to be the problem either. So we have kind of revised our model of how a nail nitride might cause vasodilation in the lung based on these results. We think that maybe there's a reaction that happens in the airway that's reducing the nitrite into nitric oxide. And we've actually seen evidence of this being true from isolated um, ventilated lungs. With just the lungs and no blood flowing through them, we can still detect some production of nitric oxide uh, when we inhale it. Uh, why does it not work by this beautiful reaction, which I told you about with the deoxyhemoglobin? Well, if you look at the kinetics of how fast nitric oxide would be produced from the reaction of nitrite with deoxyhemoglobin, competing against how fast nitric oxide would be scavenged by either oxyhemoglobin or deoxyhemoglobin, there's literally a 10 million fold difference in the rates of these reactions. So likely any nitric oxide that is produced by this reaction of nitrite and deoxyhemoglobin is quickly scavenged by all the other hemoglobin that's available uh, at a rate that's just too fast for any to escape to cause vasodilation. So then we go back to the studies with the forearm blood flow and all the other work that's been done that shows that you do get a vasodilation in the, in the vasculature in the forearm when you infuse nitrite. If this is not the reaction, how is that happening? Um, we don't know exactly, but over the last 10 years or so, it's been uh, realized or discovered that there are actually a large number of uh, metal containing enzymes in the body that are capable of reducing nitrite into nitric oxide, especially under hypoxic conditions. So this probably uh, says something about the mechanism whereby you get a decrease in blood pressure when you elevate nitrite concentration. But this is still work that's um, under investigation to figure out what is the exact mechanism for nitrite having these cardiovascular effects. Another possibility is that just a simple chemistry, uh, the pK of nitrite taking on a hydrogen is about 3.3. So that means that pH 3.3, 50% of the nitrite will actually be in the form of nitric acid, and that quickly disproportionates to make nitric oxide. So obviously our bodies are not at a pH of 3.3, but at a pH of 7.4, about one in a thousand nitrites will be able to make nitric oxide. So there's the possibility of just a simple pH-related reaction producing nitric oxide from nitrite. So in summary, the byproducts of nitric oxide metabolism still retain NO-like bioactivity. You can find this not only for nitrite and nitrate, but those nitrosophiles that I was talking about. There's many other compounds in the tissues that hold on to the nitric oxide and can store it as a kind of a reservoir of nitric oxide bioactivity. You don't need to rely continuously on nitric oxide synthase uh, to get nitric oxide bioactivity. Inhaled nitrite is able to reduce pulmonary hypertension in hypoxic glands. Uh, the status of this idea is that uh, there's a drug company in the US that has started doing clinical studies in adults with inhaled nitrite in uh, adults with sickle cell, uh, pulmonary hypertension related to sickle cell anemia. It's Pretty unlikely that this will ever be studied in newborns in a country that can offer inhaled nitric oxide gas because we don't really have much reason to believe that it's going to be that much uh, have that much benefit above nitric oxide gas. So we're kind of at a loss of how to ever get this into in big cube in, in the United States. And I understand it's not available here in nitric oxide, so perhaps that's uh, something that would be worth looking into. The mechanism of pulmonary vasodilation uh, that you get from inhaled nitrite does not appear to come from the reaction of nitrite with deoxyhemoglobin. Like I said, there's probably other reactions that happen outside the vasculature.